This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Guys, and we are back with episode 14, The Prince of Investing. And we still haven't gotten canceled. So thank you guys for tuning in. The response has been great around the globe. The response has been great around the world. And as always, guys, I don't have a lot of time, and I definitely know you guys don't have a lot of time. So we're going to jump straight into it. As you can see in the description box, as you can see in the title, it's Halloween, and we brought in the wolf. All the way from L.A., uh, Los Angeles, California, we have the real Wolf of Wall Street, Mr. Jordan Belford, here live with us all the way from L.A. I am honored to have him on. How you doing, Mr. Belford? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. Now, for people out there who don't know who Jordan Belford is, can you please tell everybody who, who you are? Um, well, I mean, I think unless you're living in North Korea or Iran, you probably have seen the movie The Wolf of Wall Street. So that was um, based on my life story. Um, Leo, the character Leo played was Jordan Belfort in the movie. And it's uh, uh, off of two books that I wrote uh, about uh, 10 years ago. Um, and, you know, they, they were turned into a motion picture. So that's who The Wolf of Wall Street is. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So we are glad to have you here live in the studio and to talk about, you know, you, you've been, you know, your life after uh, being the wolf and doing these things like that and writing the books and stuff like that. Now, one of the questions I got to ask you, right? Everybody saw the Wolf of Wall Street played by Leonardo DiCaprio, all of the great stuff like that. How accurate is the Wolf of Wall Street of who, how, how it really was back then? On some level, it was very accurate. Other levels, it was not as accurate. I'll give you some examples. Um, I think that the you know in terms of the you know gross inaccuracies would be that there's a scene in, in towards the, the two thirds into the movie where um, I get up and give a meeting and I say, uh, guys, it's time for me to leave, but Stratton will live on. And then halfway through that meeting, I change my mind and I say, fuck it, I'm staying, right? And I don't leave. That's not true. I actually left. I gave that meeting and left, um, and I went on to run another company I own called Steve Madden Shoes. So that was my other business. So um, I ran that for a few years. So that, you know, so once that happened, there's a lot of contextual issues that are thrown off. But that being said, in terms of um, more specific things like uh, um, scenes in the movie that where, where it kind of painted the wrong picture. Well, I think a good example would be that, and I understand why they did this, was that they made it seem like, you know, that the object was almost to sell shitty companies to people. And that was just never true. It just wasn't like that. I mean, you know, you make a lot more, you're in investing, you, you make a lot more selling good companies than bad companies. Now, the, mo the most money I ever made in my entire career on Wall Street was when I took Steve Madden public because it was a good company, right? So no one actively tries to sell dog shit companies. It's, it's, it's a losing proposition. Mm -hmm. The problem is that when you're dealing in those small venture capital deals that I was, a lot of companies that you think are good end up going bad or whatever is problem. So it's not like there's an actual, um, you know, hey, let's sell them dog shit. No one would ever do that because it's just a, it's a foolish proposition. That, that more, so that, that sort of gave a feel to, to the movie that, you know, we're actually out there trying to just scam people out of their money. It wasn't true. It just wasn't like that. Ultimately, it came to that, but not because of the companies. It became because of stock manipulation and sort of a stacking the deck against your your clients, which is something I think that we saw happen all over Wall Street in 2005 and six. So I'm not trying to minimize what I did wrong, but it certainly wasn't um, something that was like planned from the beginning like that. Got it. Got it. That makes sense. Now, like you made a good point. You're saying, hey, you know, yes, you know, some things may have gotten out of control, but that was not my true intention to, you know, just manipulate the market and stuff like that, right? Now, one question, how did you get the name The Wolf? Because when you hear the name Wolf on Wall Street, you're thinking that, hey, this guy, you know, just going down Wall Street, tearing up, you know, Wall Street apart, and, you know, the character that, you know, Leonardo played in you, and it's like, wow, this guy is just, you know, out there. 
How did you get the name The Wolf? Well, I, what did I that was kind of out there. I mean, like, you know, with the, the stuff that is true is the drug addiction, the women, the, the craziness. I mean, that was all true. The yachts and planes and the crazy lifestyle, right? Mm -hmm. So, and the thousands of sales meetings, you know, the, the meetings I gave and the rah, rah, rah and training the brokers, that stuff was true. And that, that's what really intrigues people in the movie, that that whole camaraderie and stuff it makes the movie amazing, right? Um, and of course, the personal conflicts with my wife and this, right, that really makes it exciting. Um, the actual name itself, believe it or not, comes from Gilligan's uh, Hawaii-based uh, TV sitcom, Gilligan's Island. So Thurston Howell III, his nickname was the Wolf of Wall Street, believe it or not. Oh. And uh, so it was like a play on that. Got it, got it. Okay. Now, we spoke about how accurate the movie was. How would you, what is some something in the movie that you probably think that was probably left out that they forgot all about Jordan Belfort? Well, that's a good question, you know? I think that um, what was left out of the movie, simply because it wasn't any one particular scene, but it was this, this idea that you see a little blip of it in the beginning where I sit down with um, Mark Hanna on my first day of work. I'm up at that restaurant that he's explained to me how Wall Street works, right? Mm -hmm. Very funny scene. And I, being a babe in the woods, say, well, can't we make our clients money too, right? Sort of, you know, idealistic young kid. He goes, no, nah, that's not what we do here, right? Mm -hmm. Well, from there, the next scene, I'm in a strip club snorting coke and going wild, right? Like, it was, it happened. That's not what happened, okay? It took a good couple of years to get from where I started to where I was like, you know, fuck everybody. You know what I'm saying? Very slow de-evolution of the human spirit, basically. So um, that, 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 I think, is what was left out, that slow progression mm. from someone who was brought up very ethical and, you know, and uh, my parents were great people. I never broke a law, I mean, you know, and then a stupid thing, right? I never was out there breaking laws my whole life. And then, you know, all of a sudden I went to Wall Street and I sort of went on this path so, um, you know, how did that happen? What was that process by that step-by-step -step incremental process? The problem is that you only have a couple hours in a movie, right? So, you know, if it was a TV series for a couple of years, you could have seen that happen. But I understand why they did what they did. Okay. So you said it was like a little slow progression into you, you know, getting into the drugs and, and getting into the, you know. The women, the, the drugs, the, the, women. the, um, the, uh, the, the uh, criminal behavior where I'm like uh, manipulating stocks and thinking it's okay, like that sort of stuff. Like how did that happen from someone who was raised well, never broke a law, right, you know? It's, it's, it's a, a different story. It's not as an exciting a story, but it's, it's a very, I think it's an intriguing one, though. Now, with that lifestyle, did you enjoy it? Listen, it, it, I always say the things that make sense at 25 don't make nearly as much sense at 55. So at 25 years old, yeah, I mean, it was fun. You're going out, you're partying like a rock star, living out every adolescent fantasy. Mm -hmm. But I look at my life today and I have to tell you, it's a thousand times better not being on drugs, having one woman I love and, you know, the, sort of, you know, waking up feeling good every day as opposed to waking up saying, oh, like, you know, trying to cover from the night before. So uh, I had fun for sure. Uh, if I could change things, I would change a few things for sure. Um, but, you know, you look, you look back and you learn from your mistakes. And I had to ask that question because, you know, you became the epitome of Wall Street. Like, you know, people thought about Wall Street. This was everybody's dream. It was like, man, look at the like, look at the yachts, look at the women, look at the, you know, right. the the drugs. So it was just like, man, that is Wall Street. You know. So that's why I had to ask you, like, hey, did you know? Yeah, looking back, I was like, man, you know, the the movies made it look great. I wasn't there. I didn't see it. I wasn't on Wall Listen, Street. You know, again, it's fun to watch someone else. But for it to be your own life is not is not all it's cracked up to be. So, but listen, I'm I'm not saying there's nothing wrong going out and partying and, mm -hmm. and sleeping with a lot of women or men, whatever whatever <laughs> turns you on if you're a man or a woman. But again, you know, you have to grow up at a certain point. So you know, you're you're, you're I'm a young guy, I'm in my twenties, and I'm you know living out my adolescent fantasies. But at a certain point, you have to grow up. All right. Now the question I have to ask you now, right? I know that you spent all these years in investing, built this amazing firm, you know hundreds of millions of dollars, you know, the Wall Street, all that great stuff like that, writing the two books, having the ups and downs that you had. Is Mr. Belfort still investing today? I 
I invest, but I, I mostly invest in private companies that I want to, to take public. I'm not really out there investing in public companies. Much okay, so you don't really venture do capital. So you don't really do stocks anymore. You do like more like venture capital is like getting, you know, new startups and stuff like that. Right. Okay. Right. Now, how do you find these new startups? Do you do you? Are they come you, to me typically. You know. Oh, they come to you. So people find you and say, "Hey, I got this idea. I got this company. I got whatever the case may be." And you you look at it and say, "Hey, you know what? I think this is worth crap, or I think this is good. Something that I get behind." Correct. Yeah. Okay. Now, are you still open for clients? Because it may be someone that's listening. Like, man, I would like to have. I'm always on. open to hearing a good idea, but. Again, um, you know, there's a process by which someone has to get to me. A lot of times, they pay me they'll, they, as consultants. They'll hire me as a consultant. That's how I'll get started. And I'll be helping them. And they'll, they'll, let's say they get so much value in what I'm doing, they'll offer me a piece of the company, and then they want me to get me more involved and so forth. So a lot of it happens that way. Okay. So you actually do consulting for, like, new startups that are maybe looking for funding. Yeah, well, I do. I do. I, you know, I do start for, for mostly not for startups as much as for companies that are already in business that have have some traction. Got it. And they want to now take their idea and monetize it, roll it out. I'm very good at showing people how to do that. Okay. All right. So now I got to ask you about the new things that's on the market nowadays. I know you you say you hey I'm I'm only private and stuff like that. What do you think about these the, the rush we have nowadays into Bitcoin and cryptocurrency? Because I saw something on Market Watch where you were saying, if you know, if I'm if I'm getting this correctly, or if that article was correct, well, you thought it was like one of the biggest scams ever. What do you think about the new cryptocurrency, Bitcoins, Litcoin, Ethereum, all the other great stuff? Um, I think that um, it's not so much that Bitcoin is a scam. It's not that. It's what's happening around Bitcoin and also the speculative fever um, and the you know, rapid rise that's based on nothing more than pure speculation. So while I believe that cryptocurrencies do ultimately could have a role in, 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 the, in the global economy, uh, the problem right now is it's just that there's all these fraudulent operators and opportunists right now who are preying upon the hopes and dreams of unsophisticated people uh, selling their new cryptocurrency as the next Bitcoin and so forth. And this is just like going to end badly because it always does. It's just a bubble of in, of really, you know, unsophisticated people running into a mall because it's been going up. And typically that's the time when things will pop out and eventually crash when everyone starts to jump in. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out. I mean, it happens again and again and again, it's history repeating itself. So, um, you know, I would look at Bitcoin right now as probably being the least risky of of the, um, of the all these things. Like, for instance, today I just uh, was on Facebook and I saw an ad, it was a paid ad, it says, take advantage of the next Bitcoin. This one could be what Bitcoin was in 2011. That's a fucking scam, okay? That's just like, you know, they're gonna, it's probably some self-invented piece of shit that's just fucking, you know, a little bit of a, you know, whatever it is, and then they create a cryptocurrency. You can do it and buy it. You can buy a program and create one now, right? Of course, you probably ten grand to do one, and they hold a lot of themselves. They'll create some interest. They'll bump up the price. They'll dump it. It's you know, pretty simple, you know. Okay, got it, got it. I get what you're saying. So you're pretty much saying it could be a classic pump and dump type situation that could be going on with the whole 100%, Bitcoin currency. A hundred percent, yeah. Got it. So, so people out there who understand what Mr. Belfort is saying, he's saying that, hey, someone gets the software, creates their own little Bitcoin, uh, run out there and pay ads, run out there and throw ads out there and say, hey, this could be the next big thing. You can get it now for a penny. Right. Everybody jumps in. They create interest. They put a big marketing plan behind it. Once everybody buys it, then they sell right. off theirs. Classic bump, uh, pump and dump. It's just classic. Got yep. it. Got it. Now, Going into, uh, you know, you being an investor, you being around, you know, seeing the good side and the bad side of investing around the world, right? You've been around good investors, bad investors, having your own situations. What advice would you give someone that is listening to this that wants to get started in investing? Well, number one, educate yourself. Right now, there's simply no excuse not to go out there and become totally financially educated in what you want to buy. All the information is out there. You get it? 
Mm-hmm. Um, so if you don't do that, shame on you. That's the number one thing. Number two, find someone who is a sophisticated investor you trust and ask them for guidance. Check their ideas with them. Just don't go on half cocked on your own. Got it, got it. So what we're going to do, guys, we're going to take a break right here. We're going to take a one-minute break, and we're going to get more into the wolf, what he's doing today, what he has out now, and how was you know, more with the wolf. So you guys stay tuned, and we'll be right back with more on the Think Tech of Hawaii. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. We have this crazy thing going on today. I was just walking by and all these DJs and producers are set up all around the city. I just walked by and I said, what's happening, guys? They told me they were making music. There were a lot of people that claimed they had no musical talent and then sat down and kind of So we do it. For you. All right. Guys, and we are back live. More with the Wolf of Wall Street, Mr. Jordan Belfort. He's here right here live. Um, if you guys haven't seen him earlier, we've been talking about all of his endeavors, you know, about him, uh, what he's thought about Bitcoin, what he thought about investing, what he thought about the movie, telling about himself, you know, his personal life, all this other great stuff. But the thing about Mr. Belfer, I saw him on The Breakfast Club, and I was surprised. Uh, when I saw him on The Breakfast Club, he was doing, um, he was talking about his new book called The Way of the Wolf. And I actually downloaded it, right? I went and got, I went and got the audio, and I went and got the audio version, and I ordered a copy to sit back and read the book. I haven't finished it all the way completely, But one of the things that I found that was very masterful about him was, you know, most people think you think Wolf of Wall Street, you think the word Wall Street, you think maybe investing. But I figured out how good of a salesman Mr. Belfer really was. He has a system. He broke down sales to like, you know, I haven't read a lot of sales books, but he broke down sales to a, I would say, um, The, the big level a <laughs> mental level. It was just crazy. He was taking it like, hey, you need to take this lip balm. You need to sniff it right when you make a deal. And the thing about it, and the way he took conversations, I was like, he he broke it down to an art to where I'm not I never considered myself a salesman. But when I thought about it, I said, well, every day we're selling ourselves. You know, if you're trying to get a job or if you're trying to make a business proposal, if you're trying to get clients, if every even if you are in a corporate position where, hey, I don't do sales. You're selling yourself in a resume. So it had a lot of good information there about the straight line salesman, about going off into Pluto and getting back and how he trained all these people. And even in the movie where he took these these kids that could pretty much, you know, uh, do anything. Couldn't close the door. (laughs) Yeah, couldn't close the door and turn them into master salesmen. Now, what do you now? What got you? What made you write this book, The Way of the Wolf? Well, I think that, you know, one thing that is portrayed well in the movie, but it's the movie's so you know, over the top that it almost like you, you, you forget about it. It's like the, the, it's how I was able to essentially accomplish what I accomplished, meaning taking these kids who are average or below average mm-hmm. that had never thought, or let's say that they, they were raised to think that they were not capable of achieving greatness. And any greatness that they naturally had in them had been basically conditioned out of them since the day they were born, first by their parents, then by their friends, by their school teachers, by the media. I mean, they had been conditioned to be average, to basically survive, not to thrive. And when these kids showed up in my boardroom, um, they had all these limiting beliefs. And also, I would say 99.9% of them actually didn't possess 
any extraordinary skills that could make them great. In other words, there's two sides to this this whole thing about, you know, every human being is capable of achieving greatness. Now, I believe that's true. I, I know it's true. However, part of achieving greatness includes learning specialized skills, possessing specialized skills, learning them if you don't, if you don't naturally have them. And what happens to most people in the world is that they're not born salespeople. I'm a born salesman. I am, no doubt. I was, since I was old enough to talk, I was just had a natural gift, and it, I developed that and, and, and honed it over the years, right? But most people are not like that. They, they don't like to influence and persuade. They feel uncomfortable. They don't know how to do it. Um, so what happens is because it's such an integral skill to success, I don't care what you do, what line of work you're in, business or personal, you could be a mom or a dad trying to influence your children to make their beds and do their homework. You could be a teacher trying to influence your students on the value of education. You could be a pastor trying to influence your congregation on a certain moral compass. It could be a politician trying to influence your constituency, a lawyer trying to influence a jury, an entrepreneur trying to influence someone to, to, lend you, to give you money, to invest in you. You could be an entrepreneur trying to recruit someone to join you, to, to buy into your vision for the future. You could be a person trying to get a job. You're trying to influence a, a owner to see the value in you. You could be an employee trying to get a raise. You get it? Like you, you want to have the value that you can give to a company recognized. Well, how do you go about explaining that to people? How do you make your ideas, your thoughts, your concepts, your dreams known to other people in a way that connects with them and moves them to take action and gets you what you want to? That's what ethical persuasion is all about. And if you don't possess that skill, what happens is your brain, my brain, the human brain is very smart. It knows it, and you will shy away from opportunity because you say, you know what? I don't really think I have what it takes. You know, if you're not good at persuasion, if you're not competent at it, you don't have to be an expert, but at least good enough. And that's the goal of the book. The book is for everybody. It's not just for salespeople. Mm -hmm. If you're a salesman, yes, the book can turn you into a top producer. It's a very powerful system. It's worked with people all over the world, millions of people, literally millions of people. It changes people's lives. But if you're not a salesperson, it's simply a matter of getting yourself to a level of competency that it, that sales, persuasion, or a fear of it will be removed and no longer hold you back from achieving what you want in life. Because it is, doesn't matter what, again, doesn't matter what you do, that skill is a linchpin skill to getting what you want. So what I did back in the day was I came up with a system for taking average people who were just okay or they were poor when it came to sales and make them into world-class salespeople. Almost it's like in a matter of days, a week, right? And once you do that, it changes the person fundamentally. They become more... Um, more powerful because they're, they're, they're empowered, essentially. You empower them to take action. They feel good about it. They feel confident about it. And the results start pouring in. And also, it's it's a change in their own mindset because they say, you know what? Okay, maybe I didn't succeed in the past. Maybe I was average my whole life, but now I know something new. I, I'm a different person. So I was able to essentially rewrite their belief systems by giving them this very powerful system for persuasion. And once you Learn this. It, it just it makes you so effective. It's incredible. That's the story. I'm not gonna lie. You know, like I'm like I said, I'm 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 not paid by Mr. Belford or anything like that. I'm just giving you a hundred percent. Like you guys have trusted me so much in the past. When I when I was uh, reading this book, it made me want to go sell something. It works. <laughs> it just works. Yeah, no doubt. It, it works. And it makes it, you, it reminds yeah. you of con it reminds you of conversations you have in real life with salespeople and stuff like that. So what I'm going to do yeah, here... Let me give you one example. Here. Like, so I wrote the book myself. I didn't have a ghostwriter. And I wrote the book in a way that I made it conversational. I wanted people to be able to connect with the book, laugh a little bit, and sort of understand, you know, here's the goal. If you're an average salesperson, it'll make you great. If you're a great salesperson, you'll say, wow, now I know why I'm so great. I know what I got to do every single... It actually shows you... It's so logical and intuitive that when you read it, like you say to yourself, wow, that makes, it all makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. If you're not a salesperson, what it will do is it will give you the ability to essentially go out and just move through the world in a more empowered way. Bottom line, that's what it does. And it's very powerful. 
So what we're going to do right here, since we got the wolf and it's Halloween, the first five people to comment on the YouTube link, you comment on the YouTube link, I will send you a copy of his book, no matter where you're at in the world. I know we got listeners in Japan and stuff like that. So we're going to do the first five people to comment on the YouTube link. You comment on the YouTube link or the Facebook link or wherever you see this. Once you comment, write comment um, the wolf, something like that. Write the wolf. If you write the word the wolf, what I'm going to do is I'm going to email you, ask you for your mailing address. You have to give me your mailing address. Some of you guys are commenting that you're not giving me your mailing address to be able to mail you the product. I can't, I can't read your mind. So what you do is if you do that, you would get the way of the wolf mailed to you wherever you're at in the world, courtesy of me. And thank you for uh, stopping by and speaking about that. Now, the thing, the thing that I, I, I noticed that was uh, great about it, you know, when you look at the book, and you look at the movie that he was a great salesman. He knew how to teach other people sales. And then he spoke about his life of going, going overseas and teaching companies that with these big sales strips. And he writes out these big sales strips and things like that. It's pretty, it was very, it was very surprising about persuasion and influence. And it's not about manipulating people. It's about knowing how to get your point across to people and stuff like that. Is there any? Is there anything else that you would like? Think speaking. Speaking of that, knowing a good salesman, right? How can someone spot when something is full of crap? Like I need to stay away. I don't need to do this. How would you? Well, how would you say someone? There, there, there's really. I think there's overall there is two telltale signs. One of the things that I focus on in the book is that in order to close at the highest level. You need to tap into both logical persuasion and emotional persuasion. There's logic and emotion. Very different things. People don't buy on logic. They buy on emotion and justify their decisions with logic. When someone's trying to influence you, sell you, if they're just making an emotional case, which is more about, you know, painting a picture of you in the future, using the product and feeling good, getting the benefit, the future pacing, but they don't focus on the logical side, saying why ABC on a logical, why does this product make sense? What are the features, the benefits? What's the value proposition? If they don't give you that side of the equation, just try to impulse you on hype and bullshit, on emotion, that's one side. Number two, if someone doesn't ask you questions about yourself and just tries to sell you without knowing anything about you, you can't sell someone something until you first ask them questions to find out what their needs are, their values, what their pain is, and what, what lack they have. So if someone just tries to ram shit down your throat, they talk, 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 and don't listen, that's enough to, to tell, tell sign. Got it, got it. Well, Mr. Belfort, is there anything you want to uh, leave with your uh, listeners, people that hear this on the podcast, watch this on YouTube, the people that's watching this live now, is there anything you want to leave with them? Well, listen, I, I mean, I, I, I think that one commonality among all people, salespeople, entrepreneurs, civilians, so to speak, right? People just out there working, just trying to make a living and, and you know, live a good life for, for themselves and their family, those they love, right? Mm -hmm. um, you need to really examine, if, if you have the belief that, and it comes, in the end, it comes down to beliefs that sales or persuasion is evil or manipulative or it's not something I need to learn I would urge you, I would urge you to really reconsider that. Not because you want to go out there and sell people, so to speak, but every idea you have, every concept that you have, you know, it has a certain value in terms of what it's worth. Is it right? Is it wrong? What's it worth, right? Well, you might have the best idea in the world. You have, might have the most value to give to someone else as an employee, as a person, as a friend, as a lover, even to find a life partner, right? whatever that might mean to you, okay? Your idea, your value, your personal value, the value of your product is either enhanced or diminished by your own ability to explain that to someone else. So I feel really, really bad for the people who are moving through life right now that don't have an internal communication platform that allows them to express themselves, to, to, to talk about their ideas, to get that their point across to other human beings in a way that connects with them, 
that doesn't piss them off or bore them or make them think you're an asshole. If you, don't, if you lack that skill, just think about how crazy it is to move through life and have great ideas that are being diminished because you don't know how to explain them to people. That's, to me, at the highest level, what this book is about. It's a communication strategy that allows you to essentially get what you want in life. And without that, you know, you end up essentially almost dying with your music on your lips, locked inside of you. The greatness that you have is locked away inside of you, and you can't unleash it because you can't explain it. That's it. You know, mm. every great leader, whether it's a Nelson Mandela, right? He had great ideas, but his, uh, his strength was in his ability to rally everyone around him, to communicate those ideas, to connect with people. Whether it was a Wozniak who had the incredible foresight with building computers, but it took Steve Jobs to communicate that and commercialize that. Whether it's a Warren Buffett, who's now the third richest man in the world today, right? Mm -hmm. Warren Buffett, when he first graduated from college, he, he, there's a great video on this. He says the first thing he did is he went out and he took a communication, a sales course. Back then it was Dale Carnegie back in the 50s. That was the gold standard back then. Today it's a straight line. But he, he did that because he knew as great as he was at picking stocks and creating value, what would he be without the ability to explain to people? You know what he'd be today? The greatest money manager in Omaha, Nebraska, that nobody ever heard of. That's it. So you have your skills for your business, your life, what you're trying to do, and then you have the ability to explain that to other people, to get them to want to buy into your idea, your vision with time and money. That's what success is about, business mm -hmm. and personal. You could be the greatest partner to, to, your, to your life, to your husband, your wife, your, your significant other. You could be a person that truly could make someone else happy. It has so much value to in life as a partner, right? You're trustworthy, you're honest, you're sincere, you're compassionate, okay? You're great in bed. You have all these great qualities, right? But you are locked up. It's, you can't explain it. I, I, to go through life like that to me is fucking insanity. So yeah. it's an easily learnable skill. The straight line will show it to you. ABC, you, it's just, it's worth it. You deserve to have the life you want. And you deserve to have a life full of, of, of riches and beauty. Everyone, I think we were created to have abundance, not lack. So that's why I think it's an important book and why I think the skill set you learn from it will change your life no matter what. Got it. So that's Mr. Belford. He said some great things there about, you know, the art of persuasion. How it's just not about selling a product. Some, a lot of times it's about selling yourself. Whereas becoming an employer, as an entrepreneur, you have to rally up a group. And that's something that he did great in the movie, where he rallied up these people to get behind him and things like that. So I'm glad for the wolf to stop by. Um, and so I got Mr. Buffett, if people want to catch you live, how can they catch you live? How could they follow you? How could they maybe get in contact with you or whatever the case may be? Go to my website. Go to your website. JordanBelfort.com. Jordan Say again. JordanBelfort.com. Mm -hmm. And I have a world tour going on right now. I'm going to be all over the place. Um, and I'd love to come to Hawaii as well. I've got to figure that out. i got to find someone in Hawaii who, who knows how to promote events. But bottom line, I'd love to do that. Um, go to my website. You'll see all my stuff that's coming out. And, um, you know, if you're like most people, you'll have a great time and you'll learn a lot at one of my events. Cool. So that's Mr. Jordan Belfort. If you want to catch him live, go to uh, jordanbelfort.com. If you want one of his books sent to you free on the show, uh, comment with the word wolf, send me your address to wherever you're at in the world, and we'll make sure you get your copy. Guys, as always, I'm. this is the Prince of Investing. My name is Prince Dykes. Thank you guys for tuning in each and every Tuesday. Thank you guys for uh, all the tremendous support. Until the next podcast, video, cartoon, book, or whatever you see me do crazy around the globe and the world, peace, be safe, I'm out. Thank you.